I'm going to talk about stop the guessing performance methodologies for production systems. And methodologies is something I've been focusing a lot for the past uh, a year and a half. And we'll see why. The audience for this talk is developers support DBAs and sysadmins. It's for people where perf isn't your day job. And so you want to fix some common issues quickly and have guidance for using existing performance tools. So this is, this is really for a broad audience. I give a lot of deep diving, kernel hacking, neck beardy talks using D-trace and kernel internals. And they have a, quite a narrow audience. So here I'm, I want to talk about things that we can all do in terms of performance analysis and monitoring and methodologies. Uh, my name is Brennan Gregg. I was just introduced. I'm a lead performance engineer. I work on tools, visualizations, and methodologies, which all three you'll see during this talk. And uh, methodologies is the focus of my next book, which is coming out this year. And as for Joint, we are a cloud uh, infrastructure, high performance cloud infrastructure company. And we do uh, always virtualization, which is really cool. So performance analysis. Where do I start? And then what do I do? Sounds really obvious, but I've done performance for a bit too long. It really helps when I go into the classroom. Um, I'm starting to teach performance classes again and give students simulated production issues without the answers and to say, go and fix these. And as it turns out, all the tools that I've written myself in the past, I've, I've written the D-Trace Toolkit, lots of other performance analysis tools, they don't help if you don't know where to start and you don't know what to do next. And as an instructor, the measure of how effective we are at performance is, can you solve the problem? It doesn't matter how you do it. The measure is, are you solving the issues you need to solve? Performance methodologies give beginners a starting point. So you're, you're faced with uh, whatever the performance need is. Casual use is a checklist, and that may be for, for many of you so that you don't miss important things. And also guidance for using existing tools. This poses the questions to ask. So I've got six methodologies to introduce. And again, this is, this is intended for this audience. So this is for a, a broad uh, group. And three of them are what I would call anti-methodologies. And so th see, these are example methodologies. They aren't intended for you to follow. Uh, but they are helpful. They illustrate some, some, some behaviors that we may do. And I've called them guessing methodologies. And then three, not guessing methodologies. So the first guessing methodology I'd like to go through, the traffic light anti-method. Very, very simple. Two steps. Step one, open the monitoring dashboard. Step two, is everything green? If so, everything's good. And we don't need to analyze it further. So a lot of us have different monitoring products, and this Traffic lights are a very common feature. The problem is that performance is subjective. It depends on the environment and the requirements. There are no universal, universal thresholds for what is good performance or bad performance. Now, an example that I'm, I'm working on right now when I'm not here at Velocity, I have two customers, and they both have an issue with latency outliers. One customer the latency outliers are between 200 milliseconds and 800 milliseconds for their, for their application. And that's bad for them. For the other customer, two milliseconds is an eternity. Two milliseconds is really, really bad. This is a particular uh, area, a, a particular industry which is very, very sensitive to latency. If I was developing a traffic light based on latency, it's very hard to pick a threshold for both of these customers. And so I'd have to do things like, well, you can configure it yourself based on your requirements. Apart from being subjective, even if I was to configure the threshold, performance is pretty complicated. Let's say I was going to do traffic lights for uh, disk, disks, storage devices, hard disks. If I was to try and code a traffic light that was utilization based, I may say, well, if one disk is 100% for two or more for, for less than two seconds, that's green, because that's just variance, and we get that. But, and then because the file system may have laid out uh, blocks a little bit unevenly, and a disk lights up a bit more for a second and a half, that's fine. But if it's more than two seconds, if a disk lights up for a long time, that's bad, because you, we're going to have queuing, uh, reads will come in and queue behind whatever it's doing. But if all the disks are at 
for more than two seconds, 100% utilized, that might be fine because the file system might be doing asynchronous transaction group flushing. Uh, file systems like ZFS do this all the time. You see all the disks light up. It's not a problem. It's writes. It's asynchronous. But if it is synchronous write I.O., then that's red if it's 100% from more than and so on and so on and so on. This gets really, really hard to do. And this isn't even right. This isn't even all the tests I'd really want to do to code a, a disk traffic light. Latency-based is better. Latency is what matters. But it still gets kind of tricky. So I.O. more than 100 milliseconds means red for one of my customers I'm working on, but not the other. Uh, if it's asynchronous writes, that's actually green because things aren't blocked behind those, those I.O. If it is, but if it's 20 milliseconds and there's like 10 of them and then, then I've got it like a database query, it blocks on all 10, that can add up. So again, it gets actually pretty complicated, even with latency, which is a fantastic metric, to come up with a rule set for the, these sort of traffic lights. And given that that's pretty complicated and given that it's subjective, there are really two types of errors we want to think about. Type 1 errors or false positives are where the traffic light will be red instead of green. And so we go and investigate why is that traffic light gone red. Turns out not to be an issue. Our team wastes time. False negatives are green instead of red. The performance issues remain undiagnosed, and the team wastes more time looking elsewhere. Um, and this is worse. Now, for subjective metrics, um, as an example, utilization, IOPS, and latency, there may be a solution. And that is, you could use weather icons for this. So this is breaking the anti-pattern of the, uh, the traffic light anti-method. Weather icons imply an inexact science and with no hard guarantees. If I'm a customer and you told me green when in fact it was red, my team just wasted five days looking in the wrong place for the issue while my company suffered a, late, a performance problem. And, and that's, that's clearly a, a severe issue that I've experienced. However, if you have told me that it is partly cloudy when it should have been cloudy, I, I think that this is, and this is something I actually did for a, a monitoring product a long time ago, this is something that's more honest between the developer and the customer. It is, it's a, the weather as a metaphor implies that this is a prediction and this may be wrong. And so the customer understands that, you understand that, it still serves the role of being attention grabbing so that you can see that something changed. Because you may say, my disks, by the way, I really did do this as part of a, a previous product. And customers could look at it and say, oh, my disks were normally cloudy, but now they're stormy. Or my disks normally only get up to a Cat 1 hurricane when the, the workload is busy, but now they're at a Cat 5 hurricane. That's really bad. And so it still served the same uh, role of the traffic lights, but really uh, let the end user know that it was a subjective metric. You can still use traffic lights. Traffic lights work for objective metrics, things that are fact. And the dashboard um, that I did a long time ago actually used both. I used weather icons for the subjective metrics and traffic lights for the objective metrics, things like errors. So if a disk has failed or a CPU has failed, that's red. It, it, it isn't subjective. It isn't complicated. It is fact. So for that anti-method, the pros for traffic lights, it's intuitive and, and attention-grabbing. It's quick initially. Uh, for cons, I've decorated these with traffic lights. For cons, type 1 errors, time is wasted. Type 2 errors, more time wasted and undiagnosed errors. And it's also misleading. Green may not mean what you think it means. Each time I see these traffic lights, I think, what is it actually testing? I kind of need to know. I need to know the exact tests it's going through, what the thresholds it's using, what they've chosen. Now, I've worked on both sides of this as an end user and as, as a developer, and sometimes a developer doesn't have a lot of experience with different customer environments and may have guessed what the thresholds should be. Well, surely this sounds bad. So understanding what exactly is being measured is... Uh, is important. Uh, and then you actually spend a lot of time, like use traffic lights, and then you have two problems. The problem you're trying to, to diagnose, and then the problem of understanding the traffic light and all, all of the, the subtle tests it might be doing or not doing. That was one anti-method. There's another anti-method before I get into the real methods. Uh, 
I call this the average anti-method. This is pretty simple. And it's just a behavior I want us to recognize that we may do. Measure the average. Use the mean, the index of central tendency. Assume a normal-like distribution or a unimodal distribution, some variant of normal or gamma distribution. And then focus on the investigation on explaining the average. I have one of these that, that I'm working on where the mean for the distribution is three milliseconds and the customer is very latency sensitive. If I focus my investigation on why it was three milliseconds, I would get pretty confused because the median is 1.2 milliseconds because most of the IO is 1.2 milliseconds. The distribution is not what you may assume. Um, here's an example. So visually, you may have the mean standard deviation, 99th percentile. You may guess that you have something that looks like this, a unimodal distribution. So one mode is talking about the peak. Um, here I've drawn it as a, a, a normal distribution. This is reality. This is from, this is actually a disk uh, IO trace that I took from a production cloud system where we have two peaks. We have uh, disk hash hits and disk hash misses. The mean, which in statistics, the average is supposed to be the index of central tendency, is not really the index of central tendency. So that's pretty confusing. And if I, if I focused my investigation on explaining why the mean was the way it was, that would, that would kind of waste time. I need to understand that there's actually two modes here, or two peaks. Here's reality times 50. And so I'm stacking up the uh, distribution. The previous slide was a distribution plot. Um, I'm now stacking these up uh, as a waterfall plot. And I've actually changed these subtly. I'll explain in a moment. These are called frequency trails. But you can see that from this selection of 50 disk uh, latency distributions, some of them are unimodal at the top and at the bottom, sort of. But it's, it's, it's really, it is kind of misleading to try and portray this as unimodal, to rely just on the mean. So many distributions aren't normal, Gaussian or, or uni, unimodal. Many distributions have outliers. Um, and these are two different problems, but you, you need to address each of them. The second one is many distributions do have outli outliers, which you will see by the max. You may catch them in the 99th or so percentiles, depending. And outliers influence the mean and the standard deviation because they are not uh, what are called robust statistics. So there are robust statistics that you, that you can use. So the median is an example. Um, and then the median absolute deviation from the median is another one, the MAD. But the mean and the standard deviation uh, will be influenced by the outliers. To see what that looks like visually, here's another disk I.O. trace. Most of my I.O. is very fast, but I have this tail, and I have all these outliers. And so my mean is dragged up. Uh, and my standard deviation is dragged up as well, because they're influenced by these outliers. This plot that I've got here is, is, a, is a, what I call a frequency trail, because it's showing a trail of points. And it's actually a combination of a density plot, which shows the uh, distribution in high resolution, and a rug plot, which is a one-dimensional one plot showing where each of the outliers are. And I developed this because I, I had a lot of outlier problems where I needed to understand both the distribution, if it was multimodal or not, and also where the, the, the exact location of the outliers. Um, distributions, you, you can introduce more and more metrics to try and get the hang of it, and so you can introduce uh, percentiles in the interquartile range, uh, other measures of variance, uh, other, other metrics. Visualizing it is pretty simple. So uh, histograms work. That looks like a bar plot. Density plots, which I showed earlier. Frequency trails, which was the previous slide. You can also use scatter plots and heat maps. Scatter plots allow me to uh, do this in another dimension. Sure, I, can, I can show the distribution over time. And then heat maps are scalable. I have, uh, maybe I should have included it as a slide, I have some printouts on my desk of scatter plots that have turned into paint because there's just too many points, and you can't tell where the detail is. And so uh, this is why I love using heat maps for that. Uh, this is a heat map of latencies on the y-axis over time, and this shows a bimodal distribution. 
And so there's a, so if, if you're using averages and you're relying on averages as part of your day job, think about how do I get this? How do I get one of those visualizations so that I can confirm, do I have multimodal distributions? Do I have outliers? And it's really get a hang of what it is. Latency is an important metric. This is, this is what many of the talks at this conference are, is about. So having good visualizations to get the, to really understand it is critical. So the average anti-method, just as an anti-method to consider, the pros, averages are versatile. Um, you can do time series line graphs with averages, uh, Little's law, uh, but then the cons, it is misleading. Averages are average. The last anti-method I'll, I'll introduce for uh, consideration is the concentration game anti-method. Pick one metric. Pick a second metric. Do their time series look the same? If so, investigate correlation. Problem not solved, go to one. So here's my first metric, app latency. I have lots of metrics. I, I, I'd fill the, the um, I'd actually preferably put 300 of these on the slide. Here's the second metric, doesn't look the same. Here's the third metric, does look the same. So my peaks are in roughly the same place. I should investigate that. That sounds like it's related to my app latency. My app latency goes up when this, this other metric goes up. Of course, from the previous anti-method, um, I understand that I probably shouldn't be doing a line graph of app latency. It should be a heat map, but. So the pros of the concentration game anti-method is very simple, ages three and up. You can discover important correlations between distant systems that are actually really hard to do. Uh, it is time consuming, and you can uncover many, many, many symptoms before the cause. Uh, the graphs I just showed were actually from a problem I was working on last week where it is a really nasty performance problem, and it was very easy for me to roll the graphs of the over 300 metrics I had, even though it's an anti-method, provided it solves the problem, the end justifies the means, very quick for me to do. So I did go through the process of rolling all the graphs and then looking for those correlations. And what I found was many, many, many of the metrics rose and fell along with the performance of the application because they were all related. And so I had, it actually took a day to pick through them and I didn't solve the problem. So uh, I, I, it's very likely I was missing metrics that I actually needed uh, to solve it. And a problem with the concentration game anti-method and also the, the, the traffic light anti-method is that you're given metrics. Um, I've given these different metrics I need to compare between, or I'm given traffic lights. And you may assume that this, this will help you solve the problem. This is what you need to do. You need to work through those metrics. But in a way, this is starting with the answers and not starting with the question. So the actual methodologies are the starting with the questions. Workload characterization method, I included this. I'm sure basically everyone already does this, but just to see what a, a normal methodology looks like. Who is causing the load? Why is the load called? What is the load? How is the load changing over time? So who, why, what, and how? And for example, who could be the, the process ID, the username, the IP address, country browser, why for the code path, logic, what the targets being accessed, URLs, how uh, things for uh, changing over the minute, hour, or day. The target of the workload characterization method is the system input, the workload, not the resulting performance. And it's important to remember to do this. There are lots of tools out there that do this, and um, there's, there's I, I could have gone through different tools as part of this talk, but there's just a lot. Uh, I, I hesitate to mention one because people may like, like it or not like it, but if you've used Google Analytics, you've got that set up for your website, they do a pretty good job of workload characterization and they answer those questions. So I understand how my website's being accessed over time. I can look at the countries, the users, the, the URLs, uh, just as an example of characterizing the workload. It's separate from the resulting performance. And the reason is, characterizing the workload helps you eliminate unnecessary work. And those are the potential, potentially the largest wins. In my job where I do performance analysis, people love it when I have the, uh, the 2,000x performance wins or the, the 20x performance wins. The truth is, 
all of the really big wins are from eliminating work. From, you shouldn't even be doing this operation. You just cut that code path off. You don't need it. Uh, and things get a lot faster. And actually, tuning and those magic tunables are usually in the percentiles, They're usually giving me the 10 and 20 percent. The cons, this only solves a class of issues. Load, but we already understand that. That's the point. Um, it can be time consuming and discouraging because most attributes examined will not be a problem, but it's important to do anyway. And the biggest problem with the workload characterization method is convincing people to do it. So I've had uh, customers where the disks are busy. It's like, well, let's look at who's accessing the disks. Oh, we don't need to. It's my database. I know who's accessing the disks. Like, well, let's characterize it. Let's, let's double check. And whilst Whilst their, their company has a serious performance issue, it sounds like I'm wasting time. Uh, but so often, checking the input to these systems has uncovered the problem. Oh, you didn't realize that another developer has installed their test on the same production server, and the disks are rattling because they're doing something. And or you had something set up in CronTab, you forgot about it. And now that's grown every day, and it's doing these logs, and they're getting bigger and bigger. And so just characterizing the workload. Um, one way to, to really get good at this is to imagine a functional diagram of your application environment. So I'm sure most people have this on your internal wiki where you've got, I've got my app servers and my database servers and my, my load balancers and storage. Look at all of the components and characterize the workload to each of them. Characterize the workload to the caches to check that the caches are even working. So quite often you have components in your environment, you check the workload and, wait a minute, there's nothing going to this caching server. Or, or it's supposed to be load balanced across eight caching servers. It's not even sending load to, to seven of them. They're idle. And so again, it's not about the resulting performance of the caching servers. It's just about the load that's being applied. The use method. So this is one I came up with to use early in an investigation to locate bottlenecks and errors very quickly, and it's something for everyone to do. For every resource, check utilization, saturation, and errors. Utilization is the time a resource was busy or the degree it was used. Uh, saturation is the degree of queued extra work, and then errors for any errors the device may have. I've got a little picture there, very simple. If you understand queuing theory, and, and that helps you understand what we're doing here, that's fine. It is very similar. And it's just a matter of checking these things. Errors are important because errors can degrade performance. And systems are often designed to be fault tolerable. So your system continues to run even though you've had some component fail. For hardware resources on a system, they can be your CPUs, main memory, network interfaces, and so on. Uh, if you can, find a system functional diagram and examine every item in the data path. And since I do a lot of system work, that's just an example system functional diagram uh, to get your head around. I want to check everything. I want to check not just the components, but also want to check all the buses, because they may be a bottleneck as well. Now, if you're thinking, how do you check the buses? How do I check the, like the, from the I.O. bridge to each I.O. controller? Um, how do I check the, the buses from the I.O. controllers to the disks? Actually, that bit's easy. You can usually run I.O. stat or use the disk metrics and infer it. Uh, there's ways to do this, but the, the, the point of this methodology is not to start with what's easy, not to start with the metrics you, you, you easily and readily have available, but to start with the questions you actually want answered. And there will be gaps. When you try to do this, you'll find that some metrics are actually really hard to get, and these can become feature requests, and so that they get added to the operating system or added to the application. This picture is for a system functional diagram. Imagine the same thing for your application. Uh, and all the internal components of the application, and also the internal components of your application environment. And you can treat those components as resources. Ideally, for example, if you have a thread pool, you need to decompose that into individual threads, because each thread itself can be maxed out. Utilization would be the time it was busy each second. Saturation would be if it has a queue and there is queued work. Errors would be if any of its input returned errors. And so you can step through your environment and come up with uh, metrics for each of these. It's very versatile. I did this when I, when I first uh, explained this. I did this for the Apollo Lunar Module Guidance System. 
A system I have absolutely no expertise with, but I can bring up all the, the documents they have online and then work through it. They have great diagrams that show the functional components, and then I can work through it and say, okay, well, what would utilization of each of these components be? How do I measure saturation if it's queued, has too much work? And how do I measure error, errors from each of those components? So, uh, and I did that exercise to see what it's like if you have absolutely no experience with a system, can you apply a methodology and, and come up with uh, an activity that's quite fruitful? For the, for the Linux systems, you iterate over each of the resources and then utilization, saturation, and errors. Uh, I, I do have a website where I've gone through how to dig them out of uh, Linux for those main ones. And yeah, it, it gets pretty tricky because it's starting from the questions and not starting from what's easy. Hopefully over time, this will, will become easier. Average metrics don't work, which I talked about in an earlier methodology. Individual components can become bottlenecks. And for the use method, when you're looking at utilization, this is important for cloud computing when we're all looking after thousands of what could be thousands of instances. Heat maps or some visualization can be very valuable. This one I'm doing CPU utilization, utilization on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, and the number of CPUs at that, t that the utilization and time range is the color of the uh, pixel or block. And so at the top of the heat map, you can see the hot CPUs. There's actually a line at 100% as there are, there are a number of CPUs that are just maxed out. The previous, when I did the multimodal distribution, that was for disk latency. It's exactly the same for CPU utilization. If you look at a big environment, you have a lot of CPUs that are idle, some CPUs that are maxed out because of, because of some thread or application error, and then some CPUs in the middle. And if you're just doing average CPU utilization, you can't identify that. So heat maps are a great way to do that. Um, and they're repairing in some products. So, uh, um, we, we do use these at Giant, and they're in. Uh, Sokonis has a way to do heat maps as well. I think there's a company that just does heat maps. Uh, the visualization itself is pretty simple. I coded up a Perl heat map example in, in, in a few hours just, to, just as an ad hoc thing for GitHub. Uh, so no excuse not to have heat maps, because it is pretty simple, um, very, very valuable. And for the use method in particular, because you want to study uh, lots of components. It helps you identify uh, high utilization. So yeah, that heat map was actually for 5,000 CPUs, and I can still make sense of it and see where details are. So other targets. Now, I mentioned some of this a bit. For cloud computing, you must study any resource limits as well as physical. So for physical, so if I'm looking at network, my network interfaces. When my network inter interfaces get to 100%, I'm gonna, going to have queuing. Uh, that can lead to high latency. It might lead to retransmits and a breakdown in performance. That's stuff we know. But in many environments of today, you can't get the network interface to 100% utilization because you're capped by a cloud resource control. And it makes sense. You've got multiple tenants are sharing the same system, and one tenant can't monopolize the network interfaces. So, the resource controls themselves become a, a resource that you need to analyze using the use method. So there may be resource controls for CPUs, uh, memory, disk, network, file system I.O. Uh, and in order to do this properly, you need to, if you are on a virtualized environment, that is, you need to see the physical system resources as well as these imposed limits as resources. Uh, we may have... Uh, saturation and errors with the physical, uh, the, the, sorry, the software contr uh, resource controls as well. Who knows if software resource controls work all the time? This, this is all code. Code can have errors. So you may get to the point where you've hit a software resource control. It's actually returning errors to the application. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm trying to cap memory and it's, and, and it's causing the malloc to fail in a way the application wasn't expecting. So. They're valid targets as well. Other resource controls for use metrics, it does work if, if you can break it down to the individual. Think of a queuing system, uh, which has a service center and a queue. 
mutex locks and thread pools. Just to step over this, so for a mutex lock, how would I do utilization, saturation, and errors? Utilization for a mutex lock would be the time during a second that it was held, so that it was busy and someone was using it. Saturation could be the uh, degree of work queued on that mutex lock. And so uh, it might be an adaptive mutex, and so you have people spinning, and you can measure that as a metric. What about an error for a mutex lock? I'd have to check the man page to see if you know, different mutex locks can even error. Uh, but if that's valid, there's another metric I'd like to look at as well. For thread pools, my application has a thread pool. Utilization. Uh, for each thread, how, how many milliseconds during a second was it active doing work? Plot that as a heat map. I may find that some threads in my pool go to 100% while other threads are idle because my hashing algorithm or my load balance al balancing algorithm doesn't work. Uh, saturation. My thread pool may have a queue that feeds the thread pool, and that shows a degree of saturation, or multiple queues. Errors. Uh, the thread pool may have a limit, and it can't create new threads, or whatever other errors that it can generate. And so on and so on for other software resources. Some of the use method metrics don't work, but they help you come up with questions and to look at areas that you may have otherwise overlooked. Especially, it breaks the habit of beginning with the metrics that the developers gave you and then trying to infer performance from them. You're turning it around. And you're starting with the questions and then seeing what can satisfy them and what gaps there are. And of course, as I've mentioned, do this for your application environment and decompose it into queuing systems. So as homework, you can actually do this. Uh, find a system functional diagram or use the slide I have. Create a use checklist on your internal wiki and then fill out the metrics based on your available tool set. So it doesn't matter what monitoring tools you use or operating system. I can do this for the Apollo Lunar Module Guidance Computer. You can do it for whatever systems you're on, and then fill out how you get them. Once you've filled that out on your internal wiki, and this is, this is what I do at work, we can then refer other staff to it where performance is not their day job. So support can use it. Customers can use it to, de to debug their own issues. Database administrators, developers. And so it becomes a resource that we can all step through and becomes a checklist. Repeat for your application environment. You will get a checklist for all staff. You will get awareness of what you can't measure. So this is the unknown unknowns become known unknowns, which are much more useful, because then you're aware of, of, of what may be missing. Those known unknowns can become feature requests, especially if if you're developing the monitoring product for your company, a lot of people do custom ones these days, or if you're purchasing a monitoring product from someone else, you can say, well, I'm working through this methodology, and I'd like these metrics. Uh, and you, you can already justify why you're doing that. So the pros of the use method, complete for resource bottlenecks and errors, not limited in scope by available metrics, no unknown unknowns. You step through everything. And it's also efficient. There is a lot of metrics out there to dig through systems. If I log into uh, some of the monitoring tools I use, I, get, I have to page down through all the statistics, and it's dozens and gets into the hundreds, whereas I'm picking three metrics to summarize a resource from what may be hundreds available. And you can, of course, you can use those other statistics. That's fine. This is, the use method is part of a methodology toolbox. It's one you use early on. It's supposed to be quick before you get into drill down analysis, or any of the other more deeper methodologies. So it's, not, it's definitely not the, the, the first and last one you use. It's, it's, it's one that you use early. Cons, it's limited to a class of issues. So this only finds resource bottlenecks. The last methodology I, I want to uh, talk about is the thread state analysis method. I haven't talked about this one before. This is something that I use, uh, I use when I'm working on resource issues uh, on any application issue after I've tried the use method. Divide thread time into operating system states. Measure states for each application thread and investigate the largest non-idle state. And that might sound obvious. So we have a minimum of two states, on CPU and off CPU. If it's on CPU, I'm executing my code or I'm spinning on a lock. <coughs> If I want to split that up, I found out, actually, I'm on CPU all the time. Splitting up executing from spinning is pretty easy. I can use any profiler that's going to look at stack back traces. Not so much of a problem. Off CPU, 
if I know my, my application thread is spending most of its time off CPU, well, that actually gets a bit ambiguous because it could be waiting for work, or it could be blocked on a lock, or it could be storage or network I.O. So it's a bit better to split it up into multiple states. And this is based on the Unix process states. So if you remember the old Unix process lifecycle diagrams that have executing, running, waiting for CPU. And we've got runnable, waiting for my turn on the CPU, anonymous paging, where I'm runnable, but I'm blocked waiting for pagins uh, or on Linux swap-ins. So that's where my application has run out of memory, and the system has paged out or swapped out application memory. And when the application is trying to run next, it's now blocked on disk IO. Uh, it's important to separate things like this out because your application is unaware that this has happened, other than having larger latency. Uh, it happens transparently and seamlessly. This is what the operating system does. It's what the operating systems have done for a long time to allow many programs run in a small amount, a limited amount of main memory. Sleeping, I'm waiting for I.O. That could be storage, network I.O., or data text pages for memory maps uh, regions, which is the same as storage I.O. Lock, where I'm waiting to acquire a synchronization lock, and then idle time, where I'm genuinely waiting for work. So I'm not doing anything. What's nice about this is it's generic. It works for all applications. And they pose questions to answer, even if it's hard to answer. And this one actually gets harder than the use method. Measuring states isn't currently easy, but you can do it. And so in Linux, I, I need to use a combination of proc, shed stats, delay accounting, IO accounting, detrace when needed, uh, things like um, using PID stat um, so I can look at disk IO, separate, so I can split CPU time up, look at disk IO. Um, on SmartOS or Solana systems, there's actually microstate accounting, which does most of them, but not all of them. So it's pretty good. The idle state is actually one of the mo most difficult to figure out. Applications use different techniques to wait for work. So they may be blocked on a conditional variable, or it may be uh, blocked on doing a read from another uh, component on a distributed system. Once you identify, and I do actually use this when I work on issues, once I identify that I'm in one of these states, and this shows why I might go to, go to what's currently painful, but let's hope it gets easier, because it is very prescriptive. Once I know that I'm in one of these states, if it's executable, I just profile stacks. I can split up user and system time. I can, if it is system time, I can analyze system calls. If it's runnable, then I examine CPU load for the entire system. It's actually pretty simple. And I examine caps if they're present. If it is anonymous paging, then I check main memory free and process memory usage, because you may have misconfigured your application, especially in cloud environments when you're on a, a two gigabyte system or a one gigabyte instance, and you've, you've moved applications around, and now they're out of memory. Sleeping, I identify the resource it's blocked on, syscall analysis, or if it's lock, it's lock analysis. And so taking things off the table uh, narrows the investigation or, or pinpoints the investigation to what I should be looking at and gets to the root cause much quicker. Compare this to what you may be much more familiar with, like looking at database query time. So my database query time went up. Uh, I, now have, I now have outliers. It's showing up in the slow query log. Well, let's look in the database to see why. You may never answer it properly from the database alone because your database query time has gone up because you're swapping. You've, you've deployed the database with a misconfigured memory. I've seen this numerous times. Now, Worked fine for a while, but the database has now grown, so it's swapped out a little bit, and, and waiting on disk is incorporated in query time. So your query time is now over a second, but you're not in the database. The kernel has just moved your memory out to disk, and it's thrashing. So it's very misleading to, to see this large query time and think that it is in the database when it's actually in the o It's something the OS has done. Same for CPU schedule or latency. So I deployed my application, it was fine, but now I'm processing more user accounts and more records, things grow. Now I'm out of CPU. And so waiting my turn on CPU is adding latency. My database query time has gone up, but I'm not in the database, I'm not running. I'm waiting on CPUs. 
And that may happen for other perturbations. Someone, someone rolled a new version of the application and it has an error and your query time goes up. And it's like, actually, the problem isn't the application. The problem is you need to upgrade the system to more CPUs. It's the same for any time spent in metric. So any metric where you have time spent in Ruby, time spent in PHP, time spent in my database, is it really in that? If you decompose it into those operating system states, then you may show that it really is in that because it's executing. Um, and then you can use a profiler and quickly get to the bottom of it. But you might find you're in one of these other states. So pros identifies common problem sources, uh, including from other applications, quantifies application effects, um, compares time numeric numerically, and directs further analysis and actions. It's currently difficult to measure all states, but with the methodologies, we're starting with the questions we want to answer. These can then become feature requests that, that if it's hard to do in your environment, it doesn't mean everyone on your team has to do it, just someone has to figure out how to measure those things and stick it on your wiki or get it into your monitoring product or ask the monitoring team to add it to the monitoring product so that you can then measure it. There are many more methodologies I didn't go through. Uh, drill down analysis, latency analysis, event tracing, scientific method. Um, those are great when performance is your day job uh, and you're going to do this stuff all the time. So in summary, stop the guessing. The anti-methodology examples I did involve guesswork and beginning with the tools on metrics. The actual methodologies pose questions and then sort metrics to answer them. You don't need to guess. Sometimes we've had to because the metrics, even if we have a good methodology, the metrics are missing. Uh, post tools like dtrace or dynamic tracing, you can measure just about anything, which is actually what has given me freedom to explore new methodologies because I have that, that wild card. I know I can always answer something if I really have to. Um, using dynamic tracing. So, thank you. And uh, that's my talk. And uh, I've put uh, some resources there that you can check out. And I think we've now got any questions from the audience. I have quite a lot of glare from the lights, so if... Uh... That's a lot for your brain. <laughs> oh, this guy right here. Oh, uh, Ted Kaczynski. It looks like he has a question. <laughs> so uh, Theo has asked the, the, the utilization in areas are fairly easy to, they're intuitive and easy to visualize. Errors you can actually do as traffic lights. Uh, utilization as heat maps, as I showed. Saturation, you can do it as a heat map. Uh, and with saturation, you may get away with this with some line graphs. Saturation is a great metric because uh, interpretation is straightforward. The higher it is, the worse it is because you have more queuing. And there are many performance metrics out there which require a lot more interpretation. But with saturation, it's just a measure of the queue. There are, people call it different things. Uh, you might call it the, the backlog is, a, is another name for the same thing. But we're measuring the uh, length of the queue. I have done this as a heat map before. And this is where I was looking at the TCP backlog. And so my application, my system has many different uh, ports it's listening on. Each of them has a TCP backlog. And I need to know if any of those back, backlogs are growing too big. And so you can put that backlog on a heat map and then visualize it that way. Ah, OK. So, so the question about microbursts. So, so with microbursts, a, a, another thing, I guess I could add another anti. If there's another anti-methodology, it would be stop thinking about one second. And I know Theo likes this as well. Because things happen within a second. And so a microburst may be 10 milliseconds where you have a large backlog. But if your metrics are based on one second averages, then you've lost those, those details. Uh, my example where I talked about doing a TCP backlog, I actually uh, measured, the, measured it event-wise. And so every time there was a, a, pa a SYN packet received, I would then add that to the distribution. And so I'm not averaging at all. So if I get a microburst, I see the distribution 
uh, in my heat map. But yeah, definitely think about um, any time you're dealing with one second statistics that don't catch micro bursts, how can you visualize them? For saturation and queue length, I think that's fine. You, it, it's basically the max, each event, bring it up as a distribution for when that event happens. And, and you may come up with other interesting, did, did you have a, one that, a pet one that you use yourself that's also good? Right, so, so doing, doing the max catches the event as well. And so, I mean, it, it simplifies it, but it, in my case, it would have been sufficient because I was just, I want to know if the max is creeping towards the um, end of the backlog where I drop packets, and so max would have been fine. And then if I have the max, it depends whether it's scalable or not, whether, I, whether that's a line graph or a heat map. So, yep. okay. yeah. So it's lunchtime. Um, my suggestion to you is to stalk Brendan Gregg um, for the rest of the day, uh, and you will be smarter when you're done talking to him. Um, come back here at 1.15, and more wicked smart people are going to talk to you about capacity planning at Twitter, which is um, a popular website. Thank you. Thank you.